available publicly. Um, so please just keep that in mind. Um, but without further ado, uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Carolyn Dimuth from Aalborg University in Denmark, uh, who will be introducing the roundtable Advancing the Field of Qualitative Research in Psychology, a European Perspective. And so Carolyn, whenever you're ready, you can let, take it. Let me butt in for one more second. Sorry, because uh, uh, Carolyn is particularly welcome because uh, she is the president of uh, EQIP. And uh, I was there at EQIP last year. And I think this is an organization that we, Squip, definitely want to connect closer with. Uh, so maybe we'll see some of you tonight at the social hour. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. So I guess I can start. So a very warm welcome to all of you also on my part. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Caroline Demuth, and I'm moderating this roundtable discussion, Advancing the Field of Qualitative Research in Psychology, a European Perspective. And I first of all would like to um, introduce myself and the presenters and the topic before we start with the roundtable discussion. So I'm associate, I myself, I am Associate Professor at Aalborg University in Denmark. My work is based in the field of cultural developmental psychology and I work with a narrative psychology and discursive psychology approach. I'm also Associate Editor of Frontiers in Psychology, Cultural Psychology, and as Michael already mentioned, I'm currently President of the Association for European Quality Researchers in Psychology. And we also, I'm very happy we have two members of the executive committee here on the panel, uh, Angelo Benozzo and Brendan Gaff. And there are also two more members of the executive committee in the conference. I saw that Eleftheria is in the audience. Hi, Eleftheria. And Abigail, if you're there, but hi too. Abigail had her talk yesterday, Abigail Locke. Um, I'm also co-editor together with Eleftheria Celu, Jeannie Georgaka, and Brendan Gaff of the Routledge International Handbook of Innovative Qualitative Psychological Research, which is um, in preparation and it is an outcome of our first international conference that we had. And you will also find contributions in that handbook from the speakers that are on the panel today. So keep an eye out for that book when it will be published. Now, I briefly want to introduce a topic before I present the other presenters. Why advancing the field of qualitative research in psychology and why a European perspective? Uh, in recent years, there have been a number of people who have become, well, a bit discontent with what we see in qualitative research. And what we want to address today is also how can we uh, have innovations in the field and do we need innovations and what's wrong or what are some points of critique. Uh, one point is that it seems like qualitative research has become mainstream that but mainstream in itself is nothing bad but mainstream in the sense that when we see textbooks many approaches uh, have become like recipe like methods uh, and not approaches in the sense of learning a craft skill and often people focus only on the techniques rather than on where does that come from, what is the school behind, what are the epistemologies behind, what are the theoretical traditions behind. And also, as we've heard uh, in the last two days on some of the panels that work with indig indigenous approaches, there's an increasing critique that these approaches have been developed in a very Western logic with a very strong focus on the individual, which we see then the most common uh, approach is doing interviews and to have the subjective view of the individual. And this focus on an individual, a subjective view, this inner view, uh, has also been increasingly criticized from various sides. So today we want to look at what, what are other approaches, what are innovations, how can we advance the field and make qualitative research even better, and why a European perspective um, well, first of all, because we were asked to do so by Michael, <laughs> and, uh, but, but also because what we see in, 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 in the textbooks is mainly uh, uh, methods that have been developed in, in uh, North American or, or uh, uh, Anglo-American context, and we want to open that up to other approaches. So I'm going to be, I'm very happy that we have a uh, great panel members that are going to discuss, and I hope you all had the chance to watch their presentations uh, that have been uploaded beforehand. If you haven't done so, please watch them. They are really great, great presentations. So the first presenter is Charlotte uh, 
Poyot, I hope I, I pronounced the name correctly. She is professor of psychology at the University of Roskilde in Denmark. She works in the field of children, combining research and developmental work, going across children's different life contexts, such as family, school, kindergarten, and recreation centers. She puts a focus on the cooperation between the groups, the grown-ups, like parents, teachers, pedagogues, psychologists, and on the communi communities of children. She has published books and articles in the areas of development, learning, professionalism, interdisciplinary work, and methodology. She works with uh, a point of departure in theoretical concepts about social practice, participation, and subjectivity. The work is aimed at methodological development in relation to creating scientific knowledge through cooperation between researchers and different groups of professionals and users, and thereby contributing to and anchoring knowledge in the development of social practice. The second presenter is uh, Julia Katila. She's a postdoctoral researcher from the Tampere University in Finland. Her research interests include video-based studies on embodied interaction. She finished her dissertation in 2018, analyzing tactile forms of intercorporeal sociality among mothers and their children. Currently, she is studying the emergence of touch and affective practices in two different contexts, among romantic partners and in healthcare interactions. That's also what she talks about and presents in the presentation that is uploaded. Um, then we have Brendan Gaff, who is professor at Leeds Beckett University. He is a critical social psychologist and qualitative researcher interested in men and masculinities. He has published many papers on gender identities and relations, mostly in the context of health, lifestyles, and well-being. He is co-editor-in-chief of the journal Social and Personality Psychology Compass, associate editor for the journal Psychology of Men and Masculinities. He has co-authored, edited uh, books in the areas of critical social psychology, reflexivity in qualitative research, and man's health. And he has put together a five-volume major work on qualitative research in psychology uh, and edited the Palgrave Handbook of Critical Social Psychology. Current projects examine men's experiences of infertility and male athlete experiences of challenging homophobia in sport. And he has recently also experimented with post-qualitative approaches, um, what he is presenting in his talk that it was uploaded. And then last but not least, we have Angelo Benozzo. He uh, describes himself as an undisciplined asso associate professor in work in organizational psychology. And he is uh, affiliated at the University of Valle d'Aosta in Italy, where he also lectures qualitative research methods. His research can be described as lying at the crossroads between organizational psychology, critical management studies, qualitative research and cultural studies. He is particularly interested in contributing to theoretical and methodological innovation for studying workplace and organizations. He draws on critical post-structural and post-human theories. He organizes the special interest group in psychology within the International Conference of Qualitative Inquiry at uh, the University of Illinois. Uh, he has published his work in a number of international journals and is associate editor of Qualitative Research in Organization and Management. And presently, his main research interests are emotions and emotion work, organizational well being coming out in the workplace, organizational culture, action research post-qualitative research methodologies, and critical discourse analysis. He is also a co-organizer of our 2024 EQUIC conference, uh, which will take place in Milan. So this is about the presenters. Now I would like uh, each presenter to give a brief statement summarizing <clears throat> the presentation that you have uploaded beforehand. And we start with the Charlotte. Can you just give a brief summary of your presentation, please? Yes, thank you. And thank you so much for the invitation to this roundtable of organizing possibility for dialogue and debate and to everybody for participating. I will try um, to quickly state three points. First, I think we need to innovate qualitative research to transcend the we they thinking 
and the othering of groups of persons in research processes. We easily constitute specific individuals and groups of other persons as the object of research, and we easily obtain quite one-sided generalizations about something characterizing other persons. And I use in the presentation research about inequality in education as an illustrative example in relation to this. Despite a point of departure in unequal life conditions, some individuals and others often become the center of focus. And often it is concluded, for instance, that inequality is related to problematic parenting, cognitive and physical inefficiency. And we psychological aid as much firmer centered in his review, or you could say a lack of so-called life management skills. I find that such abstract generalizations about other persons illustrate a methodological problem in relation to decontextualization, desubjectification, and other. And then number two, I think we need to develop methodology for how we as researchers collaborate with the persons involved in the social problems and psychological issues we are studying. To me, this involves collaborating with different parties involved in the research question and to explore how they are involved in social processes which can impact on the politics on the psychometric. I find this is a way of working with the context of the problems in a concrete way. We often talk about contextualization as a matter of course in qualitative research, but how do we gain access to explore contextual connections? I find that the concept of social conflict and the relations between conflicts of everyday life and historical political Political conflict might help us. And contextualizing the problems we explore changes the understanding of the problems. For instance, situated inequality from the presentation in schools uh, seems in our analysis as connected to political conflict as well as consequences of mutual origination, powerlessness of many parties as teachers, psychologists, social workers, etc., and to individual capitalization and displacement of problems. So that's quite another content. And then the last final point, through uh, situated qualities of research, I think we create knowledge about common and structural issues from the subject dealing with them in the end. I also get the question, was quality And an answer could be, that we explore and analyze general connections in concrete situations of social life. So you could say that knowledge and quality research is about how issues are related in social practice. We turn this situated generalization to conceptualize a movement from one-sided, you could say over-generalization, to many-sided studies of general connections to social life. This is also an effort to overcome knowledge hierarchies and othering of persons involved in the problems of the research. That was it. And in a way, it's also a way of discussing the problem you raised, Caroline. But we can discuss that later. I hope yes. I use my four minutes. Yes, thank you very much. Apparently, your uh, uh, your sound is not uh, very good. Uh, I had to concentrate very hard, and I see in the chat that I'm not the only person having that problem. Maybe you can, for the discussion, put on. Uh, my... Okay, in the meanwhile, thank you very much, Charlotte. We continue with Julia Katila. Can you please go ahead and uh, give a brief uh, three to four minute summary of your presentation? Right. Uh, yes. Hello, everyone. Nice to be here. Uh, yeah. And in my presentation, I discussed about the benefits of especially video analysis to study intimate and affective human behavior. Uh, and in the background is that given that intimate life, including touch, affection, and embodiment can be to a large extent seen as something belonging to the people's subjective experience and often also regarded as private matters, they are extremely hard to capture through research, uh, at least through traditional means. Uh, and in the presentation, I exemplified my own research project as one option to approach such intimate and embodied topics. My study entails video recordings of the everyday life of romantic couples. I recorded their life for one week, after which I interviewed the participants 
by showing them video clips of their own, uh, own behavior. And in the presentation, I analyzed a moment of kissing and uh, looked at how affect, emotion, and intimacy can be potentially captured through a detailed analysis of such moments. I highlighted how the researchers are able to use their own empathetic bodies and embodied interpretation when analyzing such video recorded moments and how the participants interviews can also support the interpretation of that video. As for some discussion points, I concluded that the researcher is not just some external observer, but is actually actively involved in the meaning making by using her own, her or his own empathetic ability to make sense of the encounters, by acknowledging the embodied knowledge, like just uh, for instance, how does it actually feel to watch the data? Uh, what are the feelings and sensations that uh, they inform us? Uh, however, uh, the researcher's interpretation should still always rely on the observable, or that's at, at least my point on the topic. Uh, though embodied, creative interpretation, uh, perhaps other means can be used to make sense of, of the actual observable. Um, one other thing I was thinking uh, when making the presentation and also listening to the other presentation is who, the really, who really benefits from the study and uh, I guess science from more generally, who utilizes or even have access to the results, uh, especially when we have these novel directions in, in the qualitative research. Um, and I guess my own take on this, that the research participants and their perspective should be the priority, meaning among other things that it is crucial to develop ways to engage with and give back to the participants and to the community or this should even be the whole starting point or premise for the study. Uh, in my own project, I resolved this uh, so that besides of the study, I, I'm also exploring ways in which watching the video data uh, from their own interactions could actually help the couples understand each other and their own interaction better. So I'm also developing like practical methods based on the research. So yeah, that's, I guess it. Thank you very much, Julia. So we move on to Brendan. Can you please summarize your presentation briefly? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks. Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining. It's a pleasure to be here. So during lockdown, I wrote a paper which uh, engaged with post-qualitative uh, thinking and very briefly, I don't know how much people know about post-qualitative work because it tends to happen outside psychology mostly. But it's a radical challenge to qualitative research because it, it, crit it critiques the whole idea of methods and data and instead, and also researcher authority, and instead it decenters research and inquiry and introduces theory as central. So uh, one of the features of post-qualitative post work is that it focuses on material, uh, focuses on bodies, objects, forces, which are supposedly entangled in networks or assemblages and there's no way of, it doesn't make sense to capture data from this messiness, if you like. So in, in the paper I wrote last year, I engaged with the post-qualitative by imagining uh, doing a project, uh, which was a very personal one, focused on my relationship with my father. And what I allowed myself to do in, in kind of an experimental way was to write creatively. And what I found was that uh, I ended up writing stuff that was unexpected and surprising <laughs> and, and so, stuff that was kind of more arts and literature rather than standard qualitative inquiry. So uh, I found it quite refreshing and uh, 
stimulating. But I also have some questions about where the post qualitative turn takes us. And in my presentation, I suggest that the post qualitative turn can challenge mainstream qualitative research, but there's still a place for the established methods that we know and love. And I think we can work in, in both uh, registers, if you like. Uh, I, I think both the post qualitative and more sophisticated qualitative research can work together. I'll stop there for now, thanks. Thank you very much, Brenda. And then Angelo, the floor is yours for your brief summary. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Caroline, uh, for inviting me in this uh, panel. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Perfect. Uh, so uh, in the video, I presented, illustrated uh, what has uh, recently fueled my research, which I summarized uh, in the video using three terms, uh, uh, which are in the title of the video, and uh, they are art, experimentation, and uh, pluriverse. Uh, so in, in more recent years, uh, um, if I say in the first word, uh, word, which is art, I found inspiration in the intertwining of arts, uh, which I mean uh, literature, film, painting, uh, uh, installations uh, with uh, uh, research. Uh, so art is uh, thinking, acting, exploring, um, emotion, thinking, and everything. And this has become part of how I work across uh, the research uh, process and of uh, how I imagine uh, uh, research. So art uh, really helped me to think about uh, uh, my research or a particular phenomena. Um, a second uh, trend that I'm following uh, closely comes under the heading experimentation with all its implication of trying out new actions, uh, new techniques, uh, new connections. Uh, so we experiment not in a neo-positivist way, but we experiment when we do not know what the result will be when we, we are doing something and have no preconception concerning what it should be experimentation by its nature breaks free of the past and dismantles all the assemblages. Experimentation is about interrupting the taking for granted, doing something different, try something out to see what's happened, creating the new. And for example, in the video I presented an experimentation that was carried out in a conference in Sweden with a, uh, some friend of mine uh, that we are trying to disturb uh, the, what we call the academic conference machine. And uh, the last word is uh, methodological, the last term is methodological pluriverse. Uh, here uh, I'm referring to, in particular, to a book uh, written by uh, Isabel Sanger. Uh, the title is uh, Une autre science possible. Uh, and uh, she suggested to take seriously, uh, seriously into account uh, the plurality of science in our research and the dialogue with plural definitions of the ways of valuing different types of research. Uh, pluriverse is a world in which many other worlds can exist and also where many other methodologies that we can invent can exist. And the pluriverse try to connect the human, the non-human and the more than human. Thank you very much, Angelo. So we can now start with our, um, go into a deeper discussion and I have prepared three questions that I would like to ask the presenters. And then if the audience have uh, questions or comments as well, you can join in also, but we start first with the presenters, but feel free to ask your questions in the chat and we will 
uh, include them. So the first question I have to the presenters is why in your view is innovation needed in qualitative research in psychology? Do we need innovation? And why in your view? So maybe we can start with Charlotte. Charlotte, are you there? Uh, yes, and will, uh, can you hear me now? Is the sound better? Yes, it's better. It's better. In a way, I started with that, that I think we need to innovate to transcend, for example, this othering, this hierarchical concept of knowledge. And, and this, um, well, two things. I think that still, even though that it's very acknowledged and widespread, uh, qualitative psychology, we still have problems arguing for what we are doing as science. And very often, I think we use more or less contradictory arguments, um, legitimizing our own work with some of the arguments we were in the beginning criticizing. So that could be one point. And then the other, I will relate more closely to my um, topic that when uh, we have this, as you also talked about, individualizing uh, understandings, uh, and I termed othering, then we, our research point to quite individualistic, uh, often compens compensatory uh, interventions. And I hope that if we innovate to be more concrete contextual, then we can point to much more concrete social conditions we can change in relation to work with the conditions for, for, for example, children, students to take part in educational institutions. Mm -hmm. So I think that if we innovate our methodology, we can also point to other um, ways of using it in the development of social practice, if that is an answer to your question. Yes, and that would mean moving away from this, just looking at the subjective experience of the individual, but look at the context, look at the social conditions uh, on the one hand, but also include them in the research process and, and an equal level. Exactly, that's very beautiful formulated. And to look, to use the subject experience to point to the social conditions, because I think the, the, the subjects experiences from the everyday life can point to those social conditions we need mm -hmm. to work with. Mm -hmm. Thank yes. you. Now, uh, you, Julia, in, uh, you, your approach is in a way, you, you work with a multimodal approach, which I'm very happy to hear because I also work with a multimodal approach. Uh, but, but the question is, it's, very not, it's not very common in psychology. I know it's, it's, it's more common in other fields. Um, so so uh, in a way, that's, that's an innovation to psychology. But in your view, Julia, is, is, is innovation needed? In, in, uh, in psychology, and, and if so, then why, in your view? Hey, uh, yes, <laughs> uh, well, um, well, first of all, yeah, when I hear the word innovation or like new direction, it always like, like why, who is this innovation for and uh, why, why we are making this change? And it's really, uh, sometimes it's, yeah, sometimes the feeling is that it's more for the researchers <laughs> than uh, than for the people. Uh, but uh, yeah, and I guess that's one of, one of the points that I kind of also mentioned in the intro that uh, to me, uh, it's important to think like how could we engage more with the community and uh, actually have our research results somehow help the community. That was somehow also in the Char Charlotte's talk, I guess, too the social uh yeah context and yeah but uh, i guess uh yeah there the, yeah there's many many responses to this but one other thing that I, i'm thinking and something that has been important in my own work which is the field of like video analysis and conversation analysis but it, i guess it goes also to other fields in psychology is the lack of bodies and embodiment <laughs> which is still very much very often uh, human life is approached from like very discursive or verbal perspective for instance or it goes it sort of forgets oftentimes the bodies and affect so to me that is something very important uh, how to kind of because 
bodies matter how we are, how they are, how, uh, so that's something that I uh, also find it's very important. Uh, and there has been like embodied and multisensorial event turn in multiple fields, which I find is useful. Uh, but yeah, uh, just, uh, just, I guess some, some things, uh, I'm gonna leave it here. Yeah, and in your approach, we you even go further, not only studying embodiment in terms of uh, studying embodied aspects of your data, but also using the body of the researcher. Oh yeah, exactly. Also like, yeah, that's importantly there. And that's quite innovative, I think. Um, well, Angelo, I want to move on to you because you, you, your approach is, is very much based in, in post-qualitative research which already the word post-qualitative indicates is something new and innovative. So in your view, do we need, you know, do we, can we leave behind all what, what has been done and what we have struggled so much for, as Brendan said in his talk, to, to be established and recognized? Uh, should we just throw that overboard and do something completely different? Or do we need innovation in your view and why? Uh, well, I, I'm in the field of work uh, and organizational psychology. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, which, uh, from, from my point of view, is the most conventional field in psychology. Uh, in general terms, in some way, uh, I think psychology is, in, is very conventional, is a very conventional field. Uh, is and this kind of conventional attitude, uh, uh, in some ways, is reflected, is transmitted, is uh, uh, so transferred uh, in methodology. Uh, I think we need, uh, mm, I would say, creativity instead of innovation. More creativity in uh, in our field, in our qualitative research. Um, and perhaps not only in, in the field of psychology, uh, mainly for two reasons, uh, I think. Um, qualitative research has become uh, a little too much, too predictable uh, in book after book, article after article, conference after conference, no? Uh, it is a, a repetition, continuous repetition of the same mold. Uh, is a reliable, stable, regulatory structure. And, uh, and so it has become a bit uh, standardized. And so there is a, the risk that uh, uh, it, it, uh, it is losing uh, the, the critical mass that can provoke. And the second reason is that very often qualitative research in psychology is carried out according to a quantitative framework. I mean, we are using the same categories, the ideas, the rules that we use in quantitative research to value, improve, and carry out our research project. And in my opinion, this is a bit dangerous because of the qualitative research is a different world. Uh, for example, also we use continue to use this, such a term as uh, data set to demonstrate scientific rigor, sampling to infer, uh, you know, and so on. But there are also um, important innovation. For, for example, the, there has been the, uh, the, the great uh, special issue of qualitative research in psychology, which is called celebrating heterogeneity in 2021. So there, there are there is space for creativity and innovation in qualitative psychology. Last but not least, um, I don't know if a postcode is gone, but recently I've written a paper saying perhaps a postqualitative is gone, is finished, is dead. So why would that be? Why do you think it's dead? Is it not fruitful or what? It's the same that we continue to institutionalize post wall So perhaps don't use this label and mm -hmm. do creative, uh, do something else, try to do something different, try to, but uh, uh, there, there has been a, a big debate about this post wall but the risk is that uh, we institutionalize again the field. So. Basically, the idea is that uh, 
to use uh, uh, to use uh, a lot of theory that come from uh, um, post structuralism, the post human, the post modern, the ontological turn, all this kind of theory to do uh, our research. This is basically the idea, and um, that's fine. That's all. So let's do it. Okay, thank you. Now. Uh, Brendan, what is your view on that? Or you already mentioned in your talk and in your brief uh, summary now also that you think a balance, we need both post-humanist post, uh, and, and more traditional. But you want to add anything? What's, what's your view on that, Brendan? Yeah, I mean, this overlaps with what Angelo was saying. Uh, psychology has been late to the game in terms of post-qualitative work. It's been happening for 20 years outside in other disciplines and in interdisciplinary spaces. But I do think it's, it, it's good for qualitative psychologists to engage with this literature because it's challenging and it can lead to uh, more sophisticated and more creative qualitative research uh, within psychology. Um, I think uh, we're at, a, we're at a stage of maturity in the evolution of qualitative psychology where we can handle uh, some radical ideas and challenges. And I also think that qualitative psychology, certainly in recent times, uh, is, is a complex, uh, pluralistic uh, kind of project uh, where actually there has been some interesting creative work, some uh, critical community projects which use multiple methods and uh, arts-based uh, approaches. So there's a lot of interesting work going on already, which almost implies uh, post-qualitative uh, perspective, but which doesn't really explicitly engage with it. And I think uh, if, if qualitative psychologists explicitly engage with post-qualitative ideas, it can be beneficial. Okay, thank you. Now that, that, that brings me to the next question because when we talk about innovations or creativity, new methods, uh, one question can arise also, of course, we do, don't do research just to do research. We do research in order to produce knowledge. So my question would be, what kind of knowledge can we produce with new methods, uh, with your approaches? Um, so if, if any of you would like to start saying something about the four panel members about how does your approach how do you think, what kind of, what kind of knowledge do, does your approach or the innovation you suggest produce that, that is different from what uh, established methods produce? Or what's the benefit of that? Should I start? Yes. Please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. It's a nice question. I, I would think I will say that while in mainstream research, knowledge is, you could say, about fixed links between isolated variables, which make up quite abstract categories and mechanisms or causal relations. I think knowledge in qualitative psychology is about um, how issues are related in social practice. You could say it's knowledge from everyday life and from the involved. And still, I would say that it's about general connections in concrete situations of everyday life. So I think that we still create general knowledge, but, gen but we're generalizing in other ways. And if you ask for, can we profit from that? I hope that uh, we can uh, um, create knowledge, uh, and I think we do, uh, useful for um, uh, people uh, developing their grasp on everyday life and developing societal institutions, um, changing social conditions for people's conduct of everyday life, you could say. Does so that make would, sense? Yes, so in your approach, the, the additional knowledge we gain is, is how, how 
specific phenomena that we study is not only embedded within the individual, but it's embedded in the larger system. Yes. Uh, and from the perspectives of individual persons, we get knowledge about the common, the structural, the historical, from how this is constituting concrete conditions for our everyday life. Thank you. Yes, any, anyway, maybe Julia, maybe you can say something about that because you have this special approach also of, of, about um, embodiment and uh, using the researcher's body also. So what, what kind of knowledge do you create by that approach? Uh, so yeah, I guess generally video analytic perspective, uh, we uh, video record the everyday naturally occurring life of people in any context which enables to kind of look at forms of sociality, how they actually occur moment by moment, in contrast to, for instance, interviews or like observations or so on and so on. So that's, I guess, uh, the video analytic perspective. Uh, I'm also utilizing uh, more, I guess, um, uh, interpretative version of uh, that because I am developing myself ways to how yeah engage how the researchers own body can be used also uh, uh, to aid interpretation especially when there is embodied and affecting moments uh, they are not just something that, that can be objectified to actual objective actions but they are something that are being felt and experienced also by the interactors themselves uh, so that's one point and well also in my own research i'm also using interviews uh, where the participants are looking at their watching their own inter happen interaction uh, afterwards and so that will allow another perspective to what happened from their perspective in that particular moment uh, it, yeah i'm studying couples and they are interaction situation for instance conflict <laughs> And you can imagine that the same situation may look at very different from, yeah, they may have different interpretations of the same, same situation and different from me as well, like as an analyst. So I feel like none of the, yeah, so there again, like only one method is not enough, but I guess that's also self-evident. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's at least some, I don't want to take too much space, so it's just some ideas. Thank you. And uh, so we uh, would like to move on then to, to Angelo. What, 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 what kind of knowledge is produced, scientific knowledge from, from a post uh, qualitative, post human approach that's different from what we, with the knowledge produced in, in other approaches in, psycho in, in qualitative research? Uh, well, I don't know if it is uh, different. Mm. I don't know, uh, but uh, I can tell you what I'm interested in. Uh, I'm interested in a kind of knowledge that is uh, undecidable. It is a kind of knowledge that allow me to continue to think. And uh, I desire a methodology that produce uh, as a result surprise and wonder um, say in other words when something is surprising or make me wonder because for example is illegible and that we can't give a meaning a precise meaning to it uh, i think uh, this is particularly productive for me for for our work uh, it is very generative uh, so produce uh, action, feeling, uh, thinking. Uh, and this is uh, also a, a way of knowing. Um, uh, in a way that's somewhat even similar to Julia's approach when she in, in, includes the body of the researcher and the emotions, right? So there's yes. some overlap in that understanding. Yes, yes. So, and, and it produces connection between as, and the participants, uh, but not only the participants, but the discourse that uh, are going around. So uh, they produce assemblages and uh, 
forces and connection and uh, line of light uh, is a rhizomatic knowledge. Uh, so uh, what is produced above all when we are lucky, because uh, sometimes we need to be lucky to find this uh, uh, lucky event, uh, is the kind of knowledge which uh, in some way resists to analysis. Uh, or produce a never ending analysis. And because of that, it continue to produce knowledge and different knowledge. So this is the, my way of thinking about this. Mm -hmm. uh, try to answer to these questions. Thank you. So, so Brendan, what is your uh, view on that? Or what is in, in your approach? I mean, you, you experimented a bit with a, with a, a post qualitative approach uh, in, in what you presented in your in your talk, uh, but otherwise you're also working with discursive psychology approach in, in the in the work that you are working with in, in the approach that you're working with, or even in your experimentation, maybe you can 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 talk about both what kind of of knowledge is produced that we don't find in other qualitative research. Well, I think, uh, first of all, I enjoyed uh, dabbling with post qualitative ideas and, and trying some creative writing, I find it quite fulfilling actually. Uh, I think there, there's a responsibility upon the researcher who's engaged in post qualitative work to make it meaningful uh, to a wider audience. I think too often what I can see is that post qualitative writing can sometimes be a bit elitist and almost exhibitionist, <laughs> kind of showing off uh, theoretical concepts, uh, making up new terminology uh, and really that type of knowledge or activity is speaking to very few people so i think the post quality of work i like uh, implies as i was saying earlier uh, critical community-based projects involving others in a very inclusive way and creating something uh, heterogeneous and uh, using arts-based methods uh, where you have different uh, networks going on, different assemblages, different distributions and intensities happening. And all you're doing is trying to capture some moments which can actually inspire people, uh, which can produce something meaningful uh, in that context, rather than make claims which uh, imply something solid or something final. It's, it's always ongoing, it's always in flux. Hope that makes sense. Yes. Thank you very much. So um, I've prepared a th third question, but in light of the time, I would say I, I, we move on to questions that the audience has. And uh, there's one question uh, from Christopher Tiske. I suppose a question that builds a bit on the, on the one being asked right now is whether we should push for innovation or creativity if this term is preferred for its own sake in qualitative inquiry, establishing it as an innovative creative form of inquiry by nature or if these values should always serve some kind of practical purpose and, and thus not be sought for their own sake. Do any of the presenters here have any thoughts on this matter? Any of you would like to say something about that? It goes a bit in the direction, what is the purpose or what, you know, who, who benefits from it, research? Or anybody from the audience or from the panel members would like to say something about that? Yes, Charlotte? I will try. I think it's very difficult to separate these things. It's also in, in one of your questions. And I, but I, I think that we, we have to work with, with general understanding, with developing general uh, theory. But I think that as you were formulating so well, involving the involved, in our empirical work will, will contribute as well to general theoretical development and relevance to 
you could say society or you could say uh, participants. So I think that uh, it's not to be separated, but maybe you are thinking about that sometimes we think, uh, especially when we are uh, financed for a specific projects, we can be caught up in, um, in serving specific interests. And I think that is a contradiction. I think that we need to be free to follow, to renew psychological theory and uh, to work theoretically. Uh, but I think that uh, this is also related to being relevant <laughs> for, for, for other uh, persons and society. So I, I think I, I will try to say that things cannot be separated, but research can be caught up in specific interest and be quite um, abstract in relation to people's everyday life. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, Michael Bamberg has a question to Angelo and maybe others as well. So is the institutional, institutionalization of qualitative uh, research in organizations such as SQUIP or EQUIP and also the attempt to internationalize qualitative inquiry potentially contributing to mainstreaming and as such antagonistic to innovation in divergency. Angela, you want to comment on that? Um, I, I think, uh, uh, Michael, I think there is the risk that uh, uh, our organization can contribute to the institutionalization of qualitative inquiry. Yes, I agree. Uh, but at the same time, this could be the spaces uh, for uh, challenging mainstream uh, uh, qualitative research, uh, such as a today panel, for example. So uh, we, we need to continue, uh, if uh, we want to challenge uh, uh, mainstreaming, I think subversion is always uh, within, it, it starts always from within the rule. Uh, you know, so we start subversion, is a subversion from within, uh, a challenge uh, uh, the institutionalization, um, starting from what we are doing now but within this organization is a space for doing something different. If I, um, I, know, I don't know if you, I answer. Yes, and uh, yeah, I, I can, uh, I, I can uh, uh, certainly uh, agree on that. That's what we are trying to do in, 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 in uh, EQIP and, uh, and uh, Angelo being both on the executive committee and on the board is the president is the secretary and organizing the next equip conference there will be a lot of space i assume for creativity at the next conference um there's a, a question building on that uh, uh from bola udegbe i'm not sure whether i pronounced the name correctly if not uh, i apologize i would also like to ask angelo to elaborate on what he means by getting caught in the encumbrances of the qualitative research um, sorry, I do not understand precisely this, uh, this question. Can you... Bola, do you want to rephrase the question, else? maybe? Elaborate a bit. Bola, are you still there? Can you maybe uh, put on your microphone and ask the question directly again? Not there. <laughs> um, but I, 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 I can't recall what, what part that was that you said about getting caught in the encumbrances of the qualitative research. Yes, getting caught, okay, in the encumbrances of qualitative research. What do you mean? Well, maybe then we move on to another question. There's a, a question from Daniel Sperling to Brendan and others, can you refer to concrete examples of post-qualitative creative innovative works to better understand your criticism? Brendan, you want Yeah, there's a special issue, I can't remember the journal, 2013, I think, Angelo might know, uh, Lather and Saint-Pierre. Um, so it's on, I think it's an education journal, and it's a special issue in post-qualitative research, and that's a great place to start. Because in Paddy Lazar's paper, 
for example, she refers to four examples of what she calls post quality research, which in my view actually turn out to be, you know, one's a feminist inspired project. Um, and I think the others are based around indigenous uh, research uh, projects. So that's why I say the, the most productive examples of quality of post quality research really are inclusive uh, involving researchers and participants together, working towards uh, you know, shared objectives, but using different approaches, different using creativity, um, and not necessarily coming up with something uh, definitive, but producing stuff that's interesting and relevant for that community. But that that special issue would be a good place to start. Thank you very much. And we got a friendly reminder that we have five minutes left. Now it's four minutes. Is there anybody in the audience who would still like to ask a question to the panel members or uh, have a comment, uh, any kind of comment that you would like to share? Anybody? I have a little bit of a question um, for, for, for Brendan and also others um, about this distinction between qualitative and post qualitative research. Um, just what exactly would, would determine which is one, and which is the other? Um, I, I think what you said in your introduction is that uh, getting you know, data from a world of uh, assemblages uh, doesn't really make sense. Um, could, could you elaborate a little bit on how that is? Well, in a post qualitative, post human materialist universe, uh, there's no such thing as methods or data. Um, you know, it doesn't make sense to separate out a researcher from research participants. We're all entangled and we don't have control over what we do <laughs> necessarily. So in qual traditional qualitative research then where you have an analyst analyzing data, um, you know, separates out the different elements which are actually inherently connected. <laughs> okay, so um, the solution that post-qualitative researchers advocate is, I guess, what Angela was saying, creativity, um, giving up any illusion that as a researcher, you have authority to interpret the worlds of others, but to uh, involve others in inclusive projects and to experiment with different ideas um, and different networks. Does that make sense? <laughs> sort of. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so we need to finish to round, round, uh, round up this wind up this this session. So thank you very much, everybody. I just want to uh, thank you, everybody, for very great um, contributions. And I encourage all of you who haven't done so to watch the presentations of the panel members who have been uploaded, where they elaborate in more detail about their research and their approaches. I want to summarize. Uh, what innovation might be fruitful for qualitative research is to go beyond the individual, beyond the subjective view, including the material world, the social world, uh, going beyond language, using other sources of knowledge like the body. Uh, and we also need to deal with the question of who has authority over the knowledge that we are producing and who is benefiting from the research. And last but not least, maybe post-qualitative research is dead and we need to some, find something new and in any way encourage creativity in uh, qualitative research. So uh, that brings me to the, to the end. Thank you very much everybody for joining and maybe we'll see you uh, at, the, at the closing session again tonight. Thank you for a very nice summary <laughs> and thank you, thank you for thank you so organizing. Much. Thank you. Bye.